So in a way, I'm trying to bridge the gap between after something or some things that are terrible have happened and what we do later on, I'm trying to think about what can we do earlier on to try and uh, put the therapists out of a job, essentially. So for many years, I've specialised in working with children who have post-traumatic stress disorder or something similar. And I've trained a lot of other uh, psychologists and other mental health professionals to do that. And it's time to sort of move upstream a bit and try and think how we can we prevent some of these difficulties from happening. Uh, one way of thinking about distress following traumatic events is to think of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Now, PTSD has these four clusters of symptoms. I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, one of them is the intrusive nature of the memories, so the way that they, they come into your mind when you don't really want them to. Children with PTSD also have hyperarousal. This can be very difficult to distinguish from ADHD or behavioural problems. It's difficult to tell the difference between a child who is not paying attention to the thing that the teacher wants them to pay attention to and a child that is busy paying attention to everything else that could be threatening. You know, what was that noise in that corridor? Was that someone who walked past that window? Because this thing that everyone wants people to pay attention to is unlikely to be a threat. But that noise I just heard, I'm not sure if that was. So we have people who, uh, children who are hypervigilant, always scanning the environment for things that might go wrong. Um, as a measure of distress, I think PTSD isn't a bad rough and ready measure. Some people would argue it's not very specific, but actually I quite like that. It provides a broad framework to think about the ways in which children respond to traumatic events. Um, how often do we see PTSD? Well, it's more often than you might have thought because one of the symptoms is avoidance. So people don't like to talk about it. People don't like to talk about the event or about the way that they react. So we almost always end up with an underreporting of PTSD. In 2005, when the NICE guidelines were published, they estimated 1% of the child population would have PTSD. Now, that 1% figure comes from Professor Bill Yule going, about 1%. And if you had to have someone take a guess like that, you'd want to get Bill Yule to do that. But as we get better at doing good, robust research, we're discovering that actually the rates of diagnosable PTSD are actually much higher than that. And there was a survey recently um, which discovered that 12.6% of females uh, aged 16 to 24 would have diagnosable PTSD. Now, when I read that, I thought that must be wrong. This is in the general population. I thought they either used a dodgy measure or they've only asked four people. And, you know, but actually, when you look at the research, it was done very well with a large sample size and with a good measure of PTSD. Now, I'm going to use this study just to illustrate something that I could have chosen any one of a number of studies. If you look at levels of symptoms of PTSD following any traumatic event, what happens is initially l lots of people will struggle. But over time, many of them actually do okay. Lots of people recover spontaneously. Um, we have quite a lot would struggle a lot to begin with and then recover. And a small percentage, in this study it happened to be 10%, would retain those difficulties. Now, I suppose my interest here is rather than waiting to see which ones are still struggling, are there things we can do in those first days and weeks that will help more people to get on the blue line rather than the yellow line? I suppose that's a bit like being on the Victoria Line rather than on London Overground. You know, you, let's face it, we'd all rather be on the Victoria Line. Now, the pr NICE practice recommendations don't have an awful lot to say in this. They say once you've got PTSD, which we normally wouldn't diagnose for a month, then fine, do trauma-focused cognitive behavioural therapy. That's got a pretty good evidence base. But before that, it doesn't have an awful lot to say. And that's because the evidence isn't particularly strong in this area. If we take a very brief overview, a kind of a whistle, -top tour, a whistle stop tour of some of the evidence, a debriefing intervention, so making the person talk about it at an early stage, doesn't seem to help. There's some evidence that it might make some people worse. If you work with the child and the parent together, that seems to help uh, some children. If you just work with the parents only, that doesn't seem to help. If you make self-help materials available, that on its own doesn't seem to help. Using an online game to help the child develop strategies doesn't seem to help. Five sessions of CBT techniques aimed at symptom management does seem to have some impact. So there's lots of, I mean, these are good studies done by really good people, and not many of them worked. So what are we left to do? Well, the NICE guidelines would say, don't do debriefing. The evidence doesn't support that. And if they're a bit older and really struggling, then do a bit of trauma-focused CBT, but we don't really have much evidence for that. So really we're left in this
The evidence and NICE guidelines will say, well, just wait. Watchful waiting is a phrase that they use in the NICE guidelines. And I want to know, is that really the best we can do once something terrible has happened? Is it really the best we can do to sit back and wait? And when your referral comes in a few days after the event, say, well, you know, get back to us in a month and we'll see how you're doing then. And if you're still struggling, then we'll think about doing an assessment and then we'll think about offering you some intervention. If we think about who gets PTSD, because as I said, not everybody does, um, we did a meta-analysis of risk factors. Now, I'm a clinician, I'm not a, an academic. I thought, a meta-analysis of risk factors for PTSD in children and young people. How hard can a meta-analysis be? I thought, it's just a posh average, isn't it? Um, turns out they're really hard, any of you that are thinking of doing it. I had to get a grown-up to help me with the sums. <laughs> then I had to get another grown-up to help me understand what the sums meant. And then eventually, we proved with statistics and a pretty graph what everybody already knew. So all the things you arrive at the trauma with make a small difference to whether or not you'll get PTSD or how bad your PTSD symptoms might be. The things around the actual event, so how big or bad was the event, were you afraid, did you think you were going to die, that makes a bigger difference. But actually an even bigger difference to whether or not you'll get PTSD is the things that after, happen afterwards. How well is your parent doing? That's really important. Do you feel supported? Are you withdrawing from your friendship group, from your family? How's your family functioning? These are much bigger risk factors than the actual event, which is great news for us as therapists and as uh, practitioners, because we can do something about that. Yes, by all means, let's try and reduce the incidence of the events in the first place. But there are things that we might be able to do to help. So what about, based on what I've said so far, if we drew on that risk factor research and we offered an intervention that was about supporting the family to function better, increasing the child's support, decreasing their avoidance, helping them to talk through how they're getting on. We worked with the child and the carer together. We didn't offer it to everyone, but neither did we wait to see who was really bad. Actually, we offered it to lots of people. Well, and you offered more than one session. Colleagues over at Yale have developed the Child and Family Traumatic Stress Intervention. Um, it's, I'm a big fan of evidence. I know it doesn't tell the whole story, but I, I think it's important to have some, some semblance of an idea that things might work. They did a really nice randomized controlled trial comparing this intervention to a pretty good intervention. They didn't just say it's better than nothing. They compared their intervention to a control condition which offered some understanding of, of trauma and how that works and some support and some training and relaxation. So it's quite a nice little package that you would expect to be quite effective. So before the intervention started, this is uh, children who experienced a variety of different traumatic events, about half of them would fulfill the criteria for PTSD. After the interventions, this had gone down a bit in those that had the control condition and gone down quite a lot in those that had the Child and Family Traumatic Stress Intervention, CFTSI. One of the nice things about this intervention is that if the child and family is still struggling at the end, you can then refer them on. So it, if nothing else, it acts as a very good extended assessment, which then can move the, the families on to the appropriate intervention. The way that it works now, they've developed it a little bit, is between five and eight sessions, particularly for seven to eight-year-olds, you aim to start within six weeks of the actual event, or the events, um, or within six weeks of the disclosure of previous events. And the idea is that you would aim to improve screening, so trying to work out who has actually got difficulties, and reduce traumatic stress symptoms and depression and anxiety. And the way you do that is you increase the communication between child and carer. One of the problems is following traumatic events, people stop talking. And so often I'll assess a child and the child hasn't told the carer that they're having nightmares. And this is news to the carer because the child is trying to protect the carer. So one of the things the intervention is aimed at doing is increasing communication and thereby improving and enhancing support. Um, and the way you do that is you meet initially with the carer and then you meet with the child separately to gather their own accounts of how things are going. And then you bring them together and you have them talk about things. And you use the measures that I'm a big fan of, questionnaires and measures, you would use those to facilitate that communication. And then you start to work out what the biggest problems are and then you work with them to try and solve some of those problems. You help, it's very collaborative, you help them to come up with their solutions and you support them in that process. Now, many people would say a randomized controlled trial, you only work with, you know, the cherry pick. 
families that are most likely to respond. Well, there's a nice study based in the child advocacy centers in the States. So these are real, real world complicated families uh, coming for help and support. And they showed very clearly, so this isn't a randomized controlled trial, it's just a measures of before and after. This is child report and parent report. These are blooming high scores on this particular measure. And after the intervention, they've come down significantly. This is a real world study. I think I find this very kind of um, promising in terms of whether we might be able to adapt it. Jason talked about domestic violence being the biggest cause of the contact with social care here in North London. And he also mentioned the impact of those events can be buffered by the presence of a trusted adult. So if we take that at face value, then this intervention is likely to be helpful. And we've managed to get some funding to pilot it in the UK. Does it work? Is it, is it something that we can actually implement? Do people, are people interested in this intervention? Um, we've had four staff who have been trained by our colleagues in Yale and continue to receive regular supervision from them. And we're hoping to work over the next year with various families in that six, beginning in that six weeks after the events or after disclosure of abuse to see whether this is something that we can implement in the UK as well. Thank you.